Okay, so we're going to get started, um, but before we do, just a couple of things. We have Elia with us, so she's going to be repertorying um, the conversations during the plenary session. We will go in order from groups one through four. For the first three questions, so the first group will share their thoughts and opinions. Um, for the three groups afterwards, if you can just add on to what was missing so that we can save a bit of time. So if there's anything you'd like to add on, that would be great. Um, and if there's a point that was really made that you'd like to emphasize, that would be great as well. Um, also, there was some of you that were here yesterday. For those of you that were here yesterday, we will ask that you take um, additional notes as well as, um, as you might be asked for them later on this afternoon. Okay, and then Rajiv and I will also be taking points throughout the discussions. So maybe we can invite group one to come on up. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, we're group one and we're given research mobilization strategies. So because we're limited with time, we're just going to go straight into the main questions before we look on the challenges and the solutions. So research mobilization strategies, the team came up with six various different strategies that we identified um, that will allow greater research uh, resource mobilization um, in the Caribbean region. So the first one is great attention to m &E and impact on evaluation. Nicole? Yeah, and um, specifically impact evaluation. So what this would allow is kind of accountability and transparency. So you can see when a project is efficient, when the, the budget is being put to good use and an actual impact is coming out of it, and that will encourage further investment. Versus um, even if it's a negative evaluation, at least you know that there is some accountability at the end of the project. And so you know you're not just investing money into a black hole, you're aware of what is coming out of it. I know impact evaluation is expensive and that's why we focus more on monitoring in the Caribbean. But I really think that evaluation is key and also for governments to take monitoring and evaluation more seriously. Um, yeah. So the second one was greater freedom of capital in the region and an integration of regional and a regional equity market. And Daniel will expound on this one a little bit. All right. So to achieve that, what we what we want is uh, economic growth in the region. We need to have a strategy where all countries are seeking growth. So we believe that if there is more integration in the movement of capital, then that will eradicate the first S SDG as well as impact the others as well. The third one that we came up with was greater education and sensitization as it pertains to SDGs. So for us as Caribbean nationals to really appreciate SDGs, we really need to get down to everybody and you know sensitize them about the various different SDGs because if I should leave Kingston now and let's say go to Clarendon and talk to some young people, a lot of them are not going to know what exactly is SDG. So filtering through perhaps the National Student Council, to the various different youth organizations about sensitization of the various different SDGs. The fourth one, I think Nicole wants to take this one, stronger investment in cap cap capacity building. Um, can, I just want to speak quickly to this as well. Getting everyone invested in the SDGs, acknowledging the role it has to play in their own lives, empowerment of everyone on every level, I think is key to, to mobilizing human resources. But stronger investment in capacity building, um, obviously we know, as I said, we have very limited human resources and skills. Um, investing in the skill building that we need specifically for um, implementation, planning, monitoring, and evaluation of the SDGs, I think is very key. It's critical um, to ensure that we have the right skills and knowledge available. Um, and then more advocacy for corporate social responsibility. So we're aware that in most of the bigger corporations in Jamaica in the private sector already have CSR departments, you know, they're very involved. But we were thinking that awareness and recognition of the role of CSR, especially the non-financial role for medium and small enterprises, is very important. Stuff like just being environmentally friendly in your own community, having a recycling program, things that don't need to cost a lot of money but can play a huge role. 
Um, and then you want to speak to the last one? Okay, so investing in debt adjustment. Um, as we know, the Caribbean, I mean, our debt issue is huge. It's one of the biggest in the world, especially Jamaica. Um, and in terms of negotiating our debt and negotiating with AMF, a lot of the time with these recent graduates that are going in and doing this, people with no experience, um, because the cost of debt negotiators and, and specialists in this area is so expensive. But the cost and drain of our debt payments on our resources is incredible. We might as well invest for a long term, you know. So investing in debt adjustment we think is key as well. And very quickly, we're just going to go through some of the challenges that we identified and some solutions and it's inclusion of young people. So some of the challenges very quickly, uh, limited platform, lack of voice to express ideas, including the common man. So we know there are several different platforms for youth leaders, youth representatives, youth ambassadors, but are they going into these constituencies and actually representing the voice of their constituents? So we have a youth rep for Jamaica, and you go to these international forums, you speak on youth is issues, but are you provided with the resources to go into these communities and hear what the actual common youth is saying and representing their voices at these platforms? So how can we get the support? Um, limited opportunities for funding, limited inclusion and decision making. Um, so there's a lot of tokenism that happened as it regards to youth contributing to policy making, policy making and difficulty in implementation of solutions, moving from actual ideas to policy. And the solutions that we came up with, we our solutions of course are youth oriented. Our solutions are um, youth oriented, so some of the solutions are, are an inclusive CE vulnerable groups participatory approach to needs assessment and feedback in development projects and intervention. So as I was saying before, we need a more participatory role in terms of youth actually going to their constituents are being provided with the resources to go to these constituencies and get the actual feedback from their various different constituencies. And to take that even further, inclusive participatory, so not just participatory in terms of like a town hall meeting, because the type of people that are showing up to that are not necessarily the most vulnerable. They're not the street children, they're not, you know, the homeless. So when needs assessments are conducted and when you go out into the field to get feedback on these in interventions and projects, it, there needs to be an assurance that this is actually inclusive. You're reaching the target groups, you know, that are most vulnerable in the population. So having the next one is having more effective youth leaders slash advocates. Um, it ties in with one in a sense that we need them to be more effective as in reaching out to their various different constituencies. But to do that, we need the resources to do so. So that in itself is self-explanatory. Provision of long-term funding for programs. So um, a lot of times when governments come up with these wonderful ideas or youth propose these wonderful ideas um, to the government, there is no way how to implement because, and, and, and I can speak to the National Youth Parliament here in Jamaica um, as an example, in not enough resources being provided for these programs. Um, next one, down with tokenism. So <laughs> we are um, recommending more youth quota slash representation for more um, youth-centric policies and not um, just representation, not just representatives or ambassadors, but an actual seat at the decision-making table. And that's our presentation. Thank you. Uh, we move straight on to group two. That's capacity building for public policy and rule of law institutions. Group two. Thank you. So we are also going to dive straight into um, answering our main question. And in answering that, we developed perhaps four main or four major, I guess, groups of uh, suggestions slash ideas that we got. The first was actually sensitization, sensitization and specifically of the sustainable development goals. In fact, quite a few of the ideas that we have were actually mentioned in the previous group. So I guess, you know, birds of a feather maybe flock at the conference together. <laughs> so a sensitization of not only the SDGs, but also the targets and the indicators in terms of we know that gender equality is goal number five. Perhaps most people know that, but not everyone knows that there's also a mission to get more girls 
um, involved in primary school up to a certain age. So the specific indicators, the specific targets also, um, the general public needs to be made aware of them and not just the overarching goals. Um, in, sense, in terms of sensitization also, I'll skip straight to policy in terms of the policies that we know that exist but we don't know of their implementation. And so whereas we know that there are policies in place for um, the SCDs, we know about the 2030 agenda, for example, in Jamaica, but we don't know to what extent it's actually being um, implemented and also in the rest of the Caribbean. And so there needs to be sensitization of not only the policies, but we also need to give these policies teeth. Um, the policies that we have in Jamaica to a large extent may be outdated in terms of the criminalization of these policies. And so um, they need teeth and I think in developing policy there also needs to be more consultation with youth. Um, I'm jumping all over the place, I'm sorry. So we, we realize with regards to policy that whereas there may be the youth parliament and I guess youth representatives for CARICOM, Commonwealth, etc. I don't know to what extent the general public uh, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Bahamas, Belize, to what extent the general public, the general youth have been involved in the implementation, in the development of these policies. So I think there needs to be a wider platform for youth to be able to um, consult with uh, the, the, the policy development, whether it be with the advisory boards or in other kinds of um, consultation. And I think that the government also needs to take these consultations into consideration rather than just acknowledging um, the consultations. So I move on to corruption. Um, no, this is one issue that I think needs to be targeted specifically in terms of how we have policies, we have programs, we have projects, but corruption is a hindrance to the implementation of all of these. So I think that or we as a group realize the importance of anti-corruption um, measures, um, the fact that we need to provide also teeth for anti-corruption bodies as well as um, persons in roles that have been accused of corruption, I think need to, need to be weeded out, as these are some of the things that are a hindrance to achieving these goals. And even um, the introduction in the Caribbean of anti-corruption expertise and anti-corruption structures that have the expertise, I think that also is a necessity. Um, moving from anti-corruption, we also need um, to have targeted data collection methods and measures. Um, one of the issues that we addressed in our group is that uh, lots of the programs and the projects that we have, that we have financed, that we have implemented, are good on paper, but in truth and in fact, the data that has been used to, to, to implement these projects tend to be outdated. One person relayed um, a story about a project that was implemented using data that was collected over 30 years ago and so um, so there needs to be targeted data collection uh, based on the projects and the program that needs to be implemented as well as I guess updating the surveys and the studies that are you know used to furnish this data um, we have also a few other ideas that may not necessarily tie into the overarching structures um, such as um, the previous group spoke about monitoring and evaluation um, of policies, projects, and, and programs. Um, we need to rework the roadmap to policy as well as have more proactive policies. Um, there needs to be also more links, we believe, with not only the region but also with diaspora. Um, we realize that a lot can be done from the diaspora, whether in Canada, the UK, or the US, in terms of assisting us um, to achieve the SDGs, not only as a region, but as our regional diasporas. Um, yeah, and witness protection as well. Uh, going back to rule of law and reinforcing rule of law. Um, we have this culture in Jamaica, I don't know about the rest of the Caribbean, of witness, of inform of dead. And one of the issues, of, sorry, um, for non-Jamaicans, informers should die. Informers being, um, <laughs> I guess, whistleblowers and persons who go to in snitches, thank you. <laughs> so um, one of the major fears that we have is that, you know, informers are often, um, you know, attacked. Um, and so we need to reinforce the witness protection as, as well as, I uh, guess, how to call them, uh, forensic, forensic technology 
everything that we need to, to, to reinforce or to, to revamp crime. Sorry, we have to wrap up. Um, just to go quickly to the challenges that we have uh, to answer the first three questions, um, we realized that we decided to group them into three main categories, economic, social, and environment. Uh, the first challenge being uh, resource accessibility, unemployment being a huge issue in the Caribbean, specifically as we realized on the paper in Jamaica and Belize and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So not only is there an issue with job scarcity, but also with job security and the quality of jobs that are being offered, um, we find that the qualified persons or persons who are qualified tend to be leaving to find better jobs abroad. And I, we believe that if the quality of jobs that were being introduced in the Caribbean were better, there would be more inclination to stay rather than to leave. Um, also, quality, access to quality education uh, in terms of, I guess, the resources that are available not only to go to school, but also the resources that are available to schools to ensure that the quality of education is a good, um, good, at a good level. Um, is there anything you want to say? I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, and also, I think there, we, we realize that there is a huge issue with gender inequality, uh, not only in Jamaica, but in the wider Caribbean in terms of the fact that women are paid 60% of what men are paid, uh, the representation of women in government and in mid-managerial positions. Um, so we believe that the social legal policy framework needs to be revamped. And um, I think I'll leave it there. So yeah, we had the task of uh, strengthening civil society organizations. Um, is, is, this is in no particular order, right guys? Well, let's take a look here. Um, number three. There we go. Okay. Um, my thing was really supposed to be financing and technology. <laughs> so, pardon? Yeah, so we've divided these answers into different groups, different people from the group three are going to be taking different topics, different categories, um, social, financial, legal, and technological. Um, all right folks we wanted to speak about the legal aspect especially because this is very critical um, the truth is a lot of these organizations by virtue of the limitations of funds they don't have the capacity to first of all hire an attorney for the purpose of registration and getting certain amount of things forwarded so two things came to mind one in Jamaica for example our legal aid services is limited only to the criminal law I think we need to contemplate a space that involves uh, legal aid for organizations who are directing cash and not just people. And so extending it to them so that they can be regularized, so they can better benefit from grant funding and the other uh, benefits that can be derived once you're in a legitimate organization. But one of the criteria is that these organizations must be fulfilling or aiming to fulfill one of the SDGs. So that is one aspect. My good friend, Giovanna, will speak up next. Uh, right, and the other legal aspect is that we found that CSOs are often hampered in their, their ability to function because of red tape and bureaucracy. So a lot of the things, especially in disaster type situations, they're not able to react exactly because of all the paperwork that needs to be done, all the things. So while we're not saying to deregular, de deregularize them, we're saying, deregulate them, we're saying uh, that instead we should have, if they are operating in one of the 17 areas, that there should be some sort of a uh, legal break from some of the red tape, some of the legal requirements that they would need to operate and do things such as like uh, running a street feeding program and having some of the permits necessary. So while they will obviously meet basic standards, a lot of the red tape things are unworkable, especially in emergency type situations. Right, yeah, okay. And for social, in terms of strengthening civil um, society engagement socially, something we've been pointing is that 
We need greater community consultation. So civil society organizations need to listen more. We need them to stop playing the hero. They need to go into the communities, ask the people what they want, what they need to get done, and not just trying to go into the communities and implementing things from their point of view. Um, so a next social um, strengthening point that we had was also to have act no that's technological sorry we wanted more private and public partnerships for CSOs as well so the the the, the private sector should get involved the corporate social responsibility and things of that sort that nature they should make it a priority um, for partnering with CSOs to get to the communities and get the work done and the next thing we had as well was about youth-led organization participating in policy making. The group spoke about that and we kind of um, share the same regard where we need less tokenism in terms of youth involvement and getting youth truly in there in the nitty gritty parts of it. <laughs> okay, um, um, Leanna said I should do technology now. Uh, okay, yeah, training and resources, yes. So we need more training and resources as well. So we need capacity building for these civil society organizations. Some of them go into the communities and we say to the people, hey, what is it that you want? And they say to us, we need a farm. We need a farm to fix, say, for instance, SDGs, um, SDG number three. Um, we can get some technical assistance for them or um, capacity building for them, funding for them. So we're not going, CSOs are not going there to do their job. They're getting, the community is going to be getting into the SDGs themselves. So CSOs are going to be main, mostly facilitating. Technological? <laughs> no? So should you come take over the second? Um, I think there's just one more topic, which was that there should be a, a hub that connects all organizations which are working on the sustainable development goals um, so whether you're a JET, whether you're a no-name organization that has just crowdfunded something, um, there should be a hub so that people can find you and discover what workshops are taking place, what volunteer days are taking place, what information is being shared. Um, I, think that's the first, I think that's one of the first stages to actually getting um, the general public more involved with understanding what the goals are about and being uh, change agents. Sorry, um, so I'm saying maybe our presentation was a bit biased because many of the persons in the group are from CSOs. So the idea, were, uh, sorry, the idea was that um, we already know that CSOs are playing an important role in implementing the SDGs at the local level or at the regional level. So the idea was to discuss the challenges that we're having or we have, so that you know we can combat them in terms of strengthening, so that we can actually implement. Oh. So, right. So access to information was one of the points that we had discussed as well, right there. We were saying a lot of the data is outdated, right? And also when we right and not readily available. So one of the solutions that we had proposed was that we need a space because, for example, in Jamaica, the access information channels that they have online, when we go there, the information is still not available when we go there. There are lots of red tape to access it. And certain things that we type in, they're sending us to different things, different links that they're sending us to. So we need a space as well that once we go online, and we type in something, we can access it more, of it, more readily. Thank you. But people just believe that people are talking about them. Eh? We need to find a way to get the information. How much people inside the ghetto that they don't know anything about, even know what is the meaning of SDA? SDG. Yeah, just to, address, just to address your question or your point, something we had spoken about was, S, was um, CSOs listening more because there's, there's really a gap, as you said. Um, sometimes the work that CSOs do is a bit elitist because we don't know what the community doesn't know and we don't know what they want. So something that we were proposing is that CSOs need to be engaging more, but not just engaging from a tokenistic point of view. Engaging, we need to be listening to the people. So we're giving them a platform for them to tell us what they want and what they want from us. 
So we're going to be giving them elementary knowledge, you know, telling them about SDGs or some or um, things of that nature, and then they can tell us, okay, so from SDG um, number one, which is no poverty, they can tell us, you know, I think um, a way that we can get out of our situation is we could probably build a park or we could have a community garden or something of that sort. So we want citizens to be listening more to the people, that way um, development is not seen in elitist vacuum. You know what I mean? Not just a town hall type of vacuum. Uh, that's an idiom that we idealized in a project that actually working and it's getting the information from parliament to tenement essentially. The purpose of that is to make it popular. When we have these wonderful goals, the, the imperative is on us to find a way to communicate to the people in a way that they understand. High-level meetings are very important and they serve their purpose. But every CSO and every person who is who's a part of this process must find a way to understand that the constituent is number one. And we must find a way to communicate in the language that they speak. It's not dumbing it down enough, it's making it very popular. And to, I mean, it's not, not very elegant, I'm going to say this, it's making it sexy, making the SDG sexy. Let me understand that this affects me directly. Um, yeah, exactly. No, my final thought was, and that will get us closer to practical implementation. So how do we move from the conference level to actually making a change on the ground? Because the SDGs are here, and the people are here. And we say, all right, this is what we're going to tell you, this is what we need to implement. Right. But if we go to the communities and say, what are the issues, what are the problems that they face, then we can actually show them, oh, this is a part of the SDGs, right. and they link it. So when you make it more familiar to them, based on their community needs, then it's easier to transit and say, hey, this is the SDGs, and this is what we are working for you to do. And in terms of what government can do, I think that the community spaces are important, and I don't think there's a lot of community spaces. And if government can actually introduce even a community center where CSOs can have access to, so that they can bring people together and say, these are what we're working on, and this is what we want to do for you, then I think that we'd achieve something. Actually, one of the good things about uh, Jamaica and the SDGs is, actually, in the, uh, last year, we, UNDP had a mission called MAPS Mission, and, uh, and it came out that uh, the Vision 2030, your national development plan is 90, almost 92% aligned to SDGs, or rather the other, the other way. SDGs are 92 percent aligned to the Vision 2030, so that means, so you know, most of the uh, the goals, you know, are included in the Vision 2030. So that's a very good plus point. And so there's actually there's a project called the Localizing the SDGs project, uh, which is uh, linked with the Vision 2030 education campaign, which is reaching the the grassroots. So I think they will uh, sort of. Be, you know, they have a plan to uh, to reach the CSOs and the grassroots to uh, carry across this message. A comment that comes up all the time at SDG type consultations, especially from the youth, and they always say the same thing that the SDGs are up here, and the people who will be implementing the SDGs are on the ground and the community. But something that we have to appreciate is that. While not everyone speaks the same jargon, the people who are working at the communities, they may not call it the SDGs, but the work that they're doing are aligned to the SDGs. And that's okay, they don't need to call it the SDGs. When monitoring of the SDGs comes on board and you have to report, and then the government collects all the data, then they can say, okay, we've achieved this percentage alignment to this goal, or, or we're this far away from achieving that goal. Getting everyone to call it the SDGs, yeah, that would be nice, it may or may not happen, but the fact is, once the work is going on in a similar fashion and moving along the same trajectory, then we're all on the same ship. Invite the last group on, which is building evidence base for policy. Group four. Oh. Hi, everyone. So we're looking at building evidence base for policy. Some of the challenges that we have identified, youth, not being familiar or aware with forums such as these. Uh, no particular platform is there for some youth to, to give their opinion on some of the SDGs that we have identified. Lack of access to resources. Not enough of a global approach to SDGs in terms of some youth not knowing that what they're doing is actually linked to the national plan. So they're just thinking individually whilst not knowing that there's a linkage happening right there. Um, 
Unemployment is a challenge as well. If they're not employed, they won't be able to find the resources to implement some of these plans. Cultural differences, there's a barrier. We have, in Jamaica, as you know, out of many one people, we have a lot of Chinese Indians. There's a barrier there, and we haven't bridged that gap as yet. That as well. Um, funding for youth development on the national plan. As you know, the population is made up of mostly youth. However, in terms of allocation of resources, a lot of money is not allocated in the budget for youth development, and that is a serious problem because we can always come here and make plans and ideas, but when we're ready for implementation of these plans, there's not enough money to do the plans. So. Um, and then also for point eight, this is sustainable youth involvement. How is the youth stay involved after the conference is like this? Um, how are the current um, avenues and venues for that involvement? Um, and most of all, um, how do existing organizations um, provide spaces for the youth to be considered valued um, and full members of their own communities? And right before we move on, as he mentioned, sustained youth involvement, what we realize as well is that some of the knowledge gained with youth, it is not, it's not for long term. For example, some of us here, we have been doing youth work for years, but when it comes, when we reach a point and we stop, that knowledge, that experience that we have, it is not appreciated in terms of we've been called upon to be youth consultants in these policy decisions. They get some other persons to come in who are not really familiar, they don't have the experience. I think that is something that we can look at as a nation to say that these young people we have here now who have the experience, who have been doing the work, when they come to a certain age, we have a network of youth who we will call upon as advisors, as consultants to sit in, in these meetings and assist in the policy decisions. Add to what she's saying about sustained youth involvement, perhaps we need to look at it in a way where as this conference was put on by, I, I'm, I'm not aware of the different persons, various organizations, various people in these, you know, positions of influence, but perhaps it, we, it can come to a stage where we here are the persons who would decide then to put on this conference and be persons who will be hosting it. That way it's actually sustainable involvement because we're actively involved, actively involved in um, spreading the awareness of the SDGs. All right, so now we're going to cover some of our proposed solutions. Um, awareness um, in youth. Um, um, so you have to be, I mean, obviously friendly about it, make it cultural, make it um, attractive and be creative. Um, I mean, we, we've talked about dancing, um, obviously it's sort of like pop-up parties um, where you've got the party bus and you show up in a neighborhood. If you could have that same sort of promotional strategy like we have for um, parties all over Jamaica and also the Caribbean, um, as talking about relevant policy um, as well as community involvement, uh, that would be a big step forward and we'll talk about data gathering for that later on. Um, a database of youth groups um, in operation. Um, greater relationship with the community, um, diversity and background um, in academia, um, and obviously these are points that we're mirroring from the other groups, um, incidentally of course. Um, and then moving on to youth involvement, um, we need the networking. Um, okay. Um, with, yeah, engaged participation, um, uh, tracking, um, um, and sort of with data gathering, I mean, you can also um, make it into sort of a game um, and looking at apps, how do you make it relevant um, as there's an increased amount of technological um, and internet penetration throughout the region. Um, number, yeah, someone want to do number three? Yeah. All right, I was saying, do you want to do it? Um, I can do it though. Holding youth accountable, um, different youth um, as watchdogs for um, SDG achievements. Um, so that's um, both for saying what are we doing right and if something is working um, and then suddenly that stops, especially when there's a transition of power between parties, um, to, to apply pressure and say that business as usual is not working in this regard. Um, and for number four, um, incorporating um, into a values and attitudes program in primary schools. Um, it's, I mean, the SDGs, for the most part, are relatively uncontroversial goals, um, not to mention they're pretty broad. Um, and as it has been mentioned, 
they're already being done um, in many places, but they're not called that. Um, but to say that there is um, both sort of international as well as national, and then community support for them, um, and to say that this is a big deal, so you can go from the grassroots, and you can go from the top, and you can meet in the middle. Um, it's very important. Yeah, just to add to what he's saying, so basically we would have to have all hands on deck for SDG to become realistic for 2030, meaning at the primary level, SDG in the primary schools, we would have to find a way to incorporate it into the curriculum. Even in our communities, community meetings, have talent shows, for example, we would choose some of the areas such as poverty, have them do a debate session on poverty, have them do a talent piece, some way to incorporate it for in layman's term, because we have it there, but not the, the, the average man won't know what it's all about. We don't, some of the Jamaicans, they don't read a lot. And as you mentioned earlier, some of our people are not educated, so they are not able, even if they see, they really don't know what it is. So we have to bring it to them in a way in which they would understand so that the average man on the street corner can know what is SDG. So it's a way we would sell SDG for it to be realistic for 2030. And we would have to start at the youth level, meaning primary school, implementing it in schools, on the street corner, going into the communities for them to get the buy-in. Because we would have to get the buy-in from the nation for it to be realistic. We alone, us in this room alone, can't make it happen. We would have to get the people of Jamaica to buy into what we're trying to do. As well as youth organizations, community organizations, we would have to get them SDGs in their work plans because as we know, for it to, again, for it to work, it would have to be everywhere. So every youth organization, the National Youth Council, the Police Youth Club Councils, the Community Development Committees, every youth organization, uh, the guilds at UA, UTEC, everywhere, get SDGs in their work plans for them to start launching some of the areas. All right. Okay. All right, so it's probably fit, was fitting that our group came last because everything that you guys spoke about, it all requires, we need data on that information, data to feed into the bigger and greater thing, the policy that would affect the youth and youth lives. Um, so our question was what information will be useful in making policy decisions related to the solutions proposed? So as it relates to... Pardon? As it relates to the awareness and stuff like that, we, need, we said we would, you should have a lot more focus groups and conduct more needs assessment. The data has, it's not just data, um, availability of data, but the data has to be disaggregated data. The SDGs compared to the M MDGs um, is more targeted in terms of its group. So we're looking at sex, age, gender, boys, girls. So we want accurate data, we want timely data, data um, geographic, demographic, all that. This, it has to be disaggregated data to affect the different lives of persons. So even in terms of rural and urban data, the realities of youth in, in rural are different from the realities of youth um, in the urban areas. Um, we need data that is comparable. So global trends, society patterns, things of that nature. Um, um, and if I could add to that for a moment. Um, it is a well-known mechanism um, and well-studied area for advertising um, as applied sociology and anthropology. Um, and we can use the same methodologies and apply them to um, the SDGs and policies to implement them. All right. Um, I'll cover that, though, just a little bit later. Okay. Um... We also thought that there needed to be a structural change at the ministerial level. So it's not just you find an activity, okay, get the youth involved, football, um, some sort of sporting um, activity, but is that it has to be a different mindset of those people in terms of collecting the data coming out for, and using those programs so you can, so that it can affect their lives. It's not just about getting them to do something and you can have, you can say as a part of your ministry, okay, the youth are active or the youth are doing this. It's not just about that, but they need to change their, the, the mindset at the ministerial level so they know that these are actually opportunities, these programs are actually events that we can draw from and take data from so we can then change their lives for, for the better. Um, and crucial to that um, is a research focus and based methodology. Um, and there have previously been studies that said um, many departments and ministries do not use a data-based methodology, 
Um, however, uh, since we're talking about gathering data, it's important for these ministries and departments to do their own internal assessments to realize that they have that as a likely issue. Um, and that can, we can talk about that from there. So the structural issues involving the youth. Um, and then also structurally integrating feedback into the consultation process um, for implementing policies. And then for um, already implemented policies, is it working? When is it working? When isn't it working? Um, and instead of having to go to an MP or a representative and go all the way through that. Those are important avenues um, for activism, but I don't think it should be the only avenue um, for it. So integrated feedback mechanisms. Um, and feedback is important and it's thick and rich data. Basically, it's um, just to add though that we really need a youth information center for Kingston and St. Andrew for this to be possible because being the city, of Jamaica, Kingston Municipality, and we don't have a youth information center where they are to go to. That is something real critical that in policy decision is something that needs to be on the budget in the short, um, in the short term plan. I have, a, I have a comment. I keep plugging myself, but look, I've been passionately working on these things for a long time. I do go down into the communities, all right? I go down to Parade Gardens and I talk with the CDC there and we talk with the principals and we talk to the man on the corner. There are, play, there are organizations which are thinking creatively and using the lots of available, like we said that we need a lot of data. Jamaica is lacking on data but there is tremendous amount of data which has been done on these sustainable development goals which if you start to focus on an area that you want to tackle you will find the information out there. So, um, I have been trying to get a location for a center, but if you want to reach out to Plant Jamaica and you want to find out how you can talk about specific sustainable development goals to the supposed man on the corner who doesn't understand sustainable development goals, is not really true. There's all different ways and diff a lot of information which is out there which they fully understand, whether the man can read or, or, or he can't read. So um, I think that a lot of people are being introduced to this now and asking for suggestions. Uh, but there are some organizations out there which some of them might not call it sustainable, the SDGs. Um, they just need to be updated and we need to, people need to link and they need to come together to not just talk about it, to actually go out there and volunteer. We're building school farms, we're training teachers, we're building people in the community, and all of these things get tied together. There are the resources that are available. There's the educational material, there's the books, there's the videos, there's the tools, there's the seeds, there's the soils, there's the compost, there's all of these things to transform an environment. Some organizations have it going, some more than others, some are longer and older and, and more well established than others, but we need to all come together so everybody knows what each other is doing as opposed to saying government needs to have a whole new... Um, um, the last thing we need is another government building trying to manage anything. You know, it needs to be private. It needs to be people that are civil society organizations and hopefully it can be a hub for all. Let me just start by saying um, great job to all the groups um, for really putting heads together and trying to come up with... Um, um, some solutions for the problems we have here, but there's a caution that I think it would be remiss of me to have not mentioned. I'm um, just listening to everything that we collectively came up with, and that is there's a common thread. We all want more forums. We all want a greater voice. We all ask local, regional, international institutions to give us that platform where we can lend our voice to the issues. But what do we do when we have that platform? It is not productive when we make very generic, very vague policy solutions. It's not. We can say the government needs to improve education. That's vague, that's generic. We now have a platform to say how the government can improve education. What specifically are we proposing to government to improve education? We need to have public-private partnerships. Yeah, of course. What specifically are we putting on this platform right now to say how public-private partnerships can work? What's the shape and the form of this public-private partnership? 
Yeah. We can all come up with beautiful, brilliant language as to how all of these things can be expressed. But when our own suggestions are so much in keeping with what is already identified in SDG documents, they were not being innovative. And so we ask for a greater voice. We ask for more forums. We ask for more platforms. But how do we use them? I'm proposing to not fall into the same trap of just talking. That when we make suggestions, we be very specific and give measurable targets as to what governments need to do. An example, I'll just look at one randomly. One of the SDG indicators for um, promoting the rule of law says something to the effect of um, unsented detainees as a proportion of overall prison population. Unsentenced detainees. How do you address that? Do we just say the government needs to improve the justice system? No. Specifically, what, does, what changes need to be implemented in the justice system? Is there a policy or a program that can be implemented? Just recently, for instance, one comes to mind, the um, government had instituted a, a somewhat of an amnesty. You know, if you have a, a case in the courts, you plead guilty, you get reduced sentence. No, that's already a solution. But when we come to a forum like this and we just say generally, fix the justice system, who do we help? Why should the UNDP, why should your government and my government give us a platform for us to say, fix the world? No, let's be specific, let's be measurable. That's all I have to say. That brings us almost to the end. Um, we've had a very productive discussion, um, and I thank you all for being part of today's Youth Forum. I think it's a good note to wrap up the discussion on because it brings back the point of what are you as an individual, regardless of the organization that you're with, what are you doing every day to advance the SDGs? Whether it's at home, your community, what are you doing? Yeah, so it's the same point that Andrew made with data. A lot of the youth organizations and CSOs have data. Do they publish it? Do they put it out there? Do they collate their data? What can you do within your own capacity to advance the SDGs? And it's just something to think about. Large focus has been on Jamaica, but if we think of the Caribbean as a region, which is something that has come up, people have mentioned regional networks and regional forums, and those things do happen, not as frequently because, unfortunately, financing is an issue, but what you have mentioned today, so data being an issue, um, m and &E being an issue, impact assessments being something that needs to be developed. So all of the things that you have actually come up with have been mentioned in other stakeholder consultations within the Caribbean region. So I think what you are saying is very valid, not just for Jamaica, but regionally as well. And I think that's something that we need to start looking at a bit more um, in terms of, well, if you're working on the environment, what other NGOs are working within the Caribbean on the environment? And somebody mentioned, I can't remember which group, but mentioned a hub of sorts for all these CSOs. And I think we need to look at that as something as a regional. So, I mean, those are things that are within our powers and that's something that we can do virtually. Like, we don't actually need to come together physically, but we can do these platforms through webinars and we can do these things virtually. And that's something that we, I think we need to consider and look into as well. All right, so earlier, I came and played my guitar with my musician friends. And of course, we promised that we would come back again. They've given me what we call a sabotage spot on the show, which is right before lunch. So everybody in there is vexed with me, you know, that my thing, I hold up them lunch. So we're going to try and make it be as impactful and prompt and to the point as possible. Now, I, you know, I, I, I like to freewheel it or freestyle it a lot. And some of the discussions I've been hearing this morning speak to exactly. In fact, my brother is still like, yeah, pack up your thing. My man with the luxurious beard, you know. My beard, my beard wants to be like your beard when it gets older. <laughs> but um, you made a very good point just, just now, right before coming on, and it's changed sort of my introduction, right? And I'll give you an example. So, Johnny lives on a street, and on this street there's a pothole, and everybody that lives on that street have to drive through the pothole and smashing up everybody's car every day. Johnny is building at his house. He might have gravel and he might have aggregate and he might have some building materials there at his house. 
But Johnny don't have no wheelbarrow. Tommy up the road have a wheelbarrow. Right? But Tommy hurt him leg and him can't push the wheelbarrow. So here comes the next virgin, Junior, now who say, all right, I will push the wheelbarrow. At the first virgin, we give some aggregate. And the plan seems like perfect collective security, right? Because one man will go give a wheelbarrow, the next man is going to put in the physical strength, and the third man is going to give the material. Except that when I go to the wheelbarrow man or the wheelbarrow man, I tell you, say, well, you know, some of the tools, they know I'm a barrow. And rare, and if you're going borrow my own, you have to go rent it and, right? Then that's a little static there. Then now they must say, we need some asphalt, make a check back. The first man who I give with the gravel. So it ends up, you know, the balance that we're supposed to be getting through this collective um, unity will lose, right? Just due to, oh, that man has more resources than me, so let him deal with that part, the rich part. Or let her do that because that is, you know, so. To talk to what you're saying, my brethren, about specificity is very, very important. And just like here in school, how many people in here are University of the West Indies um, students currently? One, two, that's a few. But, and, and the rest represent youth groups, right? So the idea is that uh, while we hear a lot of plans and there's a lot of these grandiose plans in the UN and all around the world, you know, in our governments, even in our own groups, right? We have big plans, five-year plan, three-year plan. In the end, implementation becomes an issue, right? And the little example I gave you a while ago was just kind of a metaphor of that implementational walls on the ground. I think Andrew spoke to it earlier too, right? So here comes a new psyche that needs to be developed, right, across the board. And it's not just a random thing that, oh, see some artists, are, I mean, and that will bring me into our thing. Here comes some artists who... You know, the songs I wrote, for example, this morning, I didn't write them for this forum this morning, nor did I meditate that one day I'd be presenting at SDG. You get me? I said, this wasn't written in this way, but at the same time, there's one solid truth that everyone can see and everyone works towards. And if that truth is sound enough, then it can stand the test of time, right? Now, here comes a society, and I'll even spread it widely to the Caribbean, but we know that in Jamaica, it's, I mean, that's my home, so I'll speak of Jamaica more richly. But even in my visits to several of the other islands, we know we share a similar culture right across the region. And we know also that outside of the formal education system, we have the informal system, which here in Jamaica is church and dance hall, or the dance hall, right, for those of us who don't live here. What we mean by the dance hall is not dance hall music, is the club is the party, is the, the place, the bar, wherever you hear the music, right? The, the, right, the places of social um, gathering spots, right? By virtue of this being such a strong level of informal education due to actually gaps in our real education, traditional education system, you find now that people give credence to things that are being said on the radio even more than what they learn in school in some instances. I don't know if that's across the board in every island, right? Therefore, the rationale, you know, as a marketing tool, I mentioned earlier about using this whole initiative as SDGs being a commodity that you're trading, right? So in this very same way, we're trying to market this commodity now. So, you know, what is the thing that's saleable about it? What's the thing that people are going to log on to? What's the thing that everyone is already doing? How can we group that into something that we can say, this is it? Or, you know, no, Bridget has left. He, he, oh, he's, he's over here, right? The idea is, in everything you do, you're doing, you're doing, you want, you want to have a party. How much people you want to have the party? Where you want to have the party at? Um, what type of party you want to be? A 70s party, 80s, uh, EDM, reggae, you know, what, what are you going to do? Um, where you want to have it? You want to be a day party, a night party? You want it to be charity, for charity, for non-charity? You want it to be a dance hall or a roots, etc. And you have a, a thousand decisions to make. Just like with every single thing we do, even in these things here now, the challenge does become, actually, even to go against what you're saying, no more for us to come up with the specificity, right? Because for many years, you hear a man come on the news and say, yo, we have a, a battle and the minister need to come and fix it, right? When you might have a thousand men in the community where work as mason. And quickly, the idea is that we have artists out there doing things. Shaggy, everybody know about Shaggy and Friends, who does the concert and he donated two million US dollars to the Jamaica Bustamante Children's Hospital. Big. We, um, this would be dealing with the health aspect or the social aspect of our SDGs. You know, 
our man roots on the ground, we do a, a project in primary schools that speaks directly to climate change and life on land, for example. Billy Mystic, Mystic Revealers, they do a reef protection um, project that they do out in Bull Bay, which would be life below the sea, etc. Now, this is where my virgin was speaking about specificity. We live in the country, you know, it don't make sense. This came up in a meeting as in yesterday. If, if we're in a meeting and they say the Singapore model is such and such, and in 30 years, Singapore was able to turn it around, they had the same GDP as Jamaica. You know, yes, from an economic standpoint, sure, that you, you use that. But it's different people in Singapore than they are in Jamaica. Different attitudes, different education level, different culture, lots of different things. So by us now knowing what we, what we like, that's why if we have a treat number bridge in the committee, they'll say it's going to be six aside football, it's going to be a domino tournament, it's going to be, you know what I said, things that Jamaican will love and, and already we're not reinventing the wheel. The question comes again is what is the how? Right? The how is what I want to leave you with, which is how do you get these ideas that people are already doing, A, to work them into fitting into one of these 17 goals? Or how do you take an existing initiative, uh, you know, entity and rev it up in such a way that you can either create greater connectivity across the goals or maybe come up with something innovative as per technology, like a new app that would regulate irrigation in a farm that has drought. You see what I mean? I had a whole little thing planned, but we're not going to have time to do it, really. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send, I, I, I'll find a way to send the info, right, Gillian? I'll be able to do that. To send all the participants what we had in mind. And we'll also have an open forum, you know, you will be able to call us as well and have discussions. And I mean, I, I will be off the island for a month, but I get back the middle of August, so I'll be willing to have discussions about such solutions as it relates to what you can do to make the artists represent you and fulfill these goals. Okay, so, gotta wrap up. Thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. <laughs>